As I have made my way around visiting the different parts of our diocese, it's given me a chance to really focus on, well, what, what is it that I want to be my first message as I go to places for these first times. It was what I worked on when I went to the deaneries and the first week after I was made a bishop. And since then, in various ways, with lots of opportunities to try to focus on what I consider the starting point for the work that we do. Now, the good news is this is not a new starting point. It's the starting point that comes from Jesus himself because Jesus gathered his apostles and he said then to them, go and make disciples of all the nations, what we now call the Great Commission. And so it's that work that today we speak about as evangelization, that is the first message that I want to give, evangelization, that is really taking the timeless message of the gospel, the constant unchanging reality of God, and living it and speaking about it in the ever-changing reality of the world we are in. What is it that the gospel can offer to people living at a certain time and place? The power of the gospel is that it speaks to every time and place. And regardless of cultures and locations and all the different things that make up the diversity of humankind, it is the power of the gospel that is our constant that gives us the anchor for our life here, even as we look ahead to the promise of God. So as I reflect on that connection between the timeless message of the gospel and the changing reality of our place in a time and in a certain uh, period, what I find as a good bridge are words that our Holy Father, Pope Francis, gave us. He wrote a document called The Joy of the Gospel. And in that very first paragraph of The Joy of the Gospel, Evangelii Gaudium, he, he describes what it means to truly be a disciple of Jesus, to be a Christian. He talks about the fact that we who are Christians, we are the ones who have chosen to join our life to Christ, to accept the work that he did. And that's what it means to be saved. So Pope Francis says that to be saved is to be set free from sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, and loneliness. He captures very well what it is that should mark our life, a freedom from sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, and loneliness. I find this to be very helpful as a bridge in our culture because one of the problems with our culture in their rejection of our faith very often or indifference to our faith, even our own family members, people that we had hoped would carry on the faith in the next generation, very often what they reject are overly churchy kind of words, for example, concepts that they look at and say, well, that's, that's not really based in reality. And we, if we're going to be evangelizers, what we have to do is take a step back and ask ourselves, we who have come to believe in the gospel, we are entrusted with the care of this gospel. So how, how can it speak to the needs of the world that we live in? And what I find so powerful in the words of Francis is that they capture very well today's day and age. Sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, and loneliness. It's one of the unfortunate realities of our day and age is that because of technology, many people would say they are more connected to more people than ever. And at the same time, they are suffering from sorrow, inner emptiness and loneliness. It's this strange reality of our day that we can have both at the same time this sense that I'm connected and yet feel more alone than ever. And so the power of the message of the gospel is how to bridge that gap. So if we, as people of faith, accept the great commission of Jesus to go and make disciples, then the first thing that we have to do is be very clear about our own freedom. To be very clear on the power of the gospel in our lives. And we have to get better at speaking about our freedom, about the way that we navigate the challenges of the world in which we live. 
Because at every age, when the church has grown, it's been because people of faith have shared the message of their own freedom, of their own experience, of the transforming power of the gospel. And that is what is needed in our age as it is in every age. So I want to use the readings that we have as a way to, first of all, look into our own lives and hopefully become better versed in the work of God in our lives so that we can be witnesses to other people trying to navigate the struggles of inner emptiness and loneliness and sorrow that make up the human journey too often. So let's look at this story of Emmaus. It is described for us as a journey. These disciples were going back to familiar territory and suddenly Jesus came alongside of them. And after their experience of Jesus walking alongside of them with a little bit of, of nurturing, their eyes were opened to that reality. And once their eyes were opened, their journey continued, but this instead they ran back to where their friends were to share what they had experienced. And so we see this journeying back and forth, the change that happens in them because they walk alongside Jesus even without realizing it. So let's think about their starting point. They were going home because they had experienced a great disappointment. They had come to believe in Jesus and they thought that their life was in the right trajectory. And then they watched him die on the cross. And it seemed to them that all that they imagined could happen was taken away from them. And they were crushed under the disappointment of that loss. So think about that experience of disciples in today's world. Dealing with the disappointment of life not going the way we thought, that's part of the human condition. Every one of us have had to face some disappointment, something not going the way that we wanted, and it always comes as a challenge for us. For some people, that's enough to reject their faith altogether, to say, well, if God was here, that wouldn't have happened. For the best of us, it can say, all right, God, I believe that you're still here, but you certainly don't seem as close as I wish you were at the moment. This is too difficult. Why am I facing this reality? And it can be a kind of crisis of faith for us. When we are in the middle of disappointment, we're not sure what to do. We search for something to try to cling to. These disciples, what they were trying to cling to was familiar territory, and so they were walking back home filled with their disappointment. Now, as they were lost in their disappointment, Jesus comes alongside them. They don't recognize that he is there, but his presence is absolute. And as they began to describe what it is that they experienced, we hear their disappointment when they say, but we were hoping. They talked about Jesus and all that had happened, all that they thought he was, and said, we were hoping. But then he died, and so all of our hopes are dashed. Why wasn't God there if he was so connected to God? Why was he, why was he taken from us? And so they are lost in their disappointment. But as Jesus walks with them, he starts pointing them in a new direction. He highlights for them that things that they had always known can have great power. And so it tells us that he opens for them the scriptures, the kind of words that they knew. But like us, words that we can hear in the scriptures that sound fine when things are fine, but then when we face our disappointment, we forget those words. We think that God is far from us. We are surprised that we are struggling. Even though Jesus says, if you wish to be my disciple, take up your cross. We lose sight of this reality. As Jesus walked with them, he reminded them. Then eventually, when they come to the place 
where Jesus will reveal himself, they would say, were our hearts not burning within us? They start to experience that something is different, but they don't realize it at the moment. But fortunately, even without their realizing it, Jesus continues to walk and guide them. Where he leads them is back to their familiar territory, but then he shows them that his presence is in that place as they sit down for what they think to just be an ordinary meal after the weariness of a journey. <clears throat> but Jesus takes what seems ordinary, the meal that they share, and it tells us that he breaks the bread for them. And in the breaking of the bread, their eyes were opened. For us as Catholics, that's what this church is. Every week we are on our journey. We gather here. We come back to what seems familiar and the Lord is present to us as he breaks the bread and opens the scriptures. He is always closer than we realize. So what it is that must be the witness of our faith is a, a recognition that we face disappointment that the world and all of its challenges, they co it comes into our lives and it takes away things that we wish we could have held on to. But even when we find ourselves disappointed, when we were hoping for something that does not work out the way we want, God is there alongside of us, reminding us of the words of Scripture, nourishing us in the Eucharist when we gather for Mass. The same story of these disciples can be our story. And the more conscious we are of our story, the more we are able to navigate the struggles of this world and be free of sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, and loneliness. And when our lives are a witness to that freedom, then our lives become attractive and our words can be the words that evangelize, the words that help others still on the journey gain the perspective that only comes when we realize Jesus is walking alongside. In our second reading for today, we have this interesting phrase that we are told to conduct yourselves with reverence during the time of your sojourning. Conduct yourselves with reverence. What does reverence mean? As Catholics, of course, we hold up the idea of reverence. We talk about certain actions and gestures conveying reverence. We, we do certain things in our worship that are intended to be reverence. But what real reverence is, is the connection between the state of our hearts and the external actions of our lives. It has to be both. It has to be that our hearts are turned to God and the way that we navigate and live and walk and move in this world reflects the direction of our heart. And so when we make small gestures like a sign of the cross or we genuflect before the tabernacle, when we kneel and bow, we are showing that our hearts are turned toward a God that our eyes cannot see and yet with the eyes of faith, we know is truly present. And so we are encouraged to conduct ourselves with reverence so that the manner of our lives is such that our external actions point to a deeper internal reality. The Lord walks alongside us. He tries to direct our attention to the truths of God that too often we forget because of the disappointments of our life. And yet at the end of the journey, he shows that he is there for us. And so my prayer is that as we gather again for this Eucharist, that we will allow those words of Jesus to penetrate our hearts that our eyes will be opened to his presence, providing us the strength that we need for this part of the journey, even if this part of the journey is only making it until next week, because he is always present for us. And when we learn to recognize him in our journeys, we discover a freedom that can only be found in Jesus. And when we learn to live in that freedom and to speak about that freedom, then we become evangelizers and we carry out the mission that Jesus gave 
to his first disciples and gives to us. Go and make disciples of all the nations. Let it be so for us in our time. Let it be so for us today. Because the Lord makes himself known to us in the words of Scripture and in the breaking of the bread.